Hey, it's Josh Benson, one of the quad hosts here at There's No Business Like, and I want to invite you to come and see us at our booth, booth 251, at the Midwest Arts Expo. Each one of the quad hosts here are part of the professional development for the conference, and then we'll also be there in the expo hall, again at our booth, booth 251. We'll be doing some live recordings. We'll have a couple of activities there in the booth, and we'll also have some cool stuff to give away. So come and see us at the Midwest Arts Expo. Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Welcome back, everybody, to There's No Business Like. This week, we're doing something a little bit different, and we will be interviewing one of our own. Today's interview will be with Josh Benson. But joining me on this interview is my friend, Danielle. Oh, hey, it's Danielle from the Alden and McLean, Virginia. And I can't wait. All right. Well, let's jump right into it. Wait, who uh, is it with? Josh Benson. Did you say that already? I did. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Danielle, do you have anything to start with? Yeah, Kevin, I have a lightning round to start with. That's what I have. That's what I'm going to do. Yay, lightning round. A lightning round. Can somebody explain to me what a lightning round is? Okay, here's the deal a lightning round is when I ask you a question and you answer quickly, but lightning fast, if you will. But I reserve the right to say, really? To (laughs) anymore. And also, no, 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 no. Start over. Choose a new answer. So it's like (laughs) a lightning round with some hail. Do you understand? Not at all. Let's Not guess. at all. Excellent. Here we go. How do you take your coffee? Black. No, the answer we were looking for is hot like your mom. Two. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants. Wait, can we rewind? Is it like when you say hot like your mom, is it like Josh's mom or like your mom? It's it just general. It g- general just mom? The general your mom. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. All of our, yeah. No, once I was at this like college thing and they were serving pancakes and someone was like, how do you like your pancakes? And somebody responded hot like your mom. And whenever anybody <laughs> asks me, how do I take anything? That's always what goes in <laughs> Lightning round with hail. What's your favorite type of cuisine? Italian. Hmm. Who's your favorite Disney character? Lightning round. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sven. From Who is Sven? Sven is the reindeer in Frozen. Oh, did I've have you ever cried him. to Frozen? No, uh, probably. Lightning. What is your go-to karaoke song? Friends in Low Places. Hmm. I can't imagine why. Do you have any pet peeves? Everything has a place. And when that things aren't in those places, I lose my mind. Quietly like fully? at home and don't say anything to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very healthy. <laughs> so glad to hear it. For my marriage, it is very healthy <laughs> response. <laughs> so I wrote this one in scribbly writing, so I think I know what it says. Uh, what is the next business you want to start? Because you don't currently have enough. Just we're all thinking it. Correct. Currently... I am planning a line of canvas paintings and t-shirts that correspond with those canvas paintings that are actually elements from the murals that I've painted. The overall concept, I want to be under the umbrella of Arts Rebellion. I want to launch all that sometime within the next six months, but I've got to find time to get it started. Yeah, it sounds like you've got plenty of time for that. What prank do you want to pull on Kevin? (laughs) Cheese in his running shoes. (gasps) Like what kind of cheese? Like, like blue cheese, like oh. crumbly, squishy. So cheese he'll just think it's not cheese. bad. Interesting. I was I was thought you would have gone with like easy cheese because then it's like squishy in your toes. No, 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 it gets squishy as you run. Oh, oh. oh. I like that oh. in this in this scenario. Like I don't notice that there's blue cheese in my running shoes. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, these are what my running <laughs> shoes feel like now. <laughs> Which dwarf do you most relate to, and why is it dopey? <laughs> uh, i'm i'm gonna yeah it probably is dopey <laughs> just constant glee and, and happiness towards the world despite whatever is happening yeah Do you also think you look that. good in a purple hat i love purple <laughs> like that is my go-to color specifically hat though oh he uh, could totally rock that off. But yeah. he could. Like a sleek he could ride, purple like, hat? Yeah, like that specific hat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah a night hat. You need to bring those back. 
Yeah, get at the a next conference. Night hat. At the next conference, I will not be seen without a purple night hat. <laughs> That's a vibe. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this very successful lightning round. That's that's the end of the interview. Just, <laughs> what else do you need to know? Kevin, why are you here? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> really, just like I am like, I think I'm just color commentary today. <laughs> Co- You're just saying colors? that's a that's a sports reference. That's <laughs> it's inappropriate. Sorry. Foul Sorry. on the play. Foul on the play. Danielle doesn't know sports. <laughs> um, okay, so we have an interview to do today. So we're going to move on to less lightning, more you talking kind of questions. Do you understand? Mm, kind of. Yeah, I don't really understand either. But why don't you tell us your origin story and skip the trauma, but also tell us about all your jobs? I grew up in a really small town of about 3,000 people. At the time, had a great theater program in the high school. I actually found a passion for set design and lighting design in that theater program. And that's how I thought I was going to move through life in theater. I, I initially went to SIU Carbondale with a focus on set design and lighting design, and then oddly dropped out because I didn't think I had a future in the theater industry. I was partying way too much. That was a big part of me dropping out. Let's not act like there was any any different thing there. But another part of it was that I had already worked for two years um, in summer stock uh, as a carpenter before I went to college. I did that in the summers while I was in high school. Having that experience before getting into the educational setting and then having to regress and take introduction classes whenever I've already been doing it professionally for two years really didn't inspire me at all. And mm. I've lost all passion for it at that point. So I left. I took a summer job building houses with a construction company. By the end of that summer, started to work with a friend of mine and we co-managed a uh, oil change shop. And from there, I started working at a auto body shop, initially doing engine work, then doing uh, framework, and then uh, learning body work, and then eventually becoming the painter for the body shop for three years. Um, and in the meantime, in the evenings, and I'd take a week of vacation and I'd go and I'd work for a company and I'd put up a design and, and build out a set for them. And um, and so I kept freelancing for theater companies and theater, theater organizations the entire time that I was working in the body shop. And I just couldn't stay away from it. During that time, a friend of mine invited me up to, to do production design for a rave production company. So uh, like in Madison, party Wisconsin. Raves? Yeah, party raves. And, and so we built out full sets uh, for the DJs. Uh, the DJs were, I, I still think back on it and love it because this is early 2000s. At these raves, the DJs could only spin vinyl. So it was vinyl only raves. Cool. And so it was really cool because there's a true artistry within that. And so there was a lot of focus put into the set that was behind the DJs. Like at one point there was kind of a like video game type of setting. I did all the rigging to have aerialists suspended dressed as video game characters uh, doing aerial work above the crowd. Some real, really, really, Do you really still cool have your stuff. Princess Peach dress? I do. I do. It doesn't fit anymore, but I still have it. <laughs> That was that was another theatrical outlet for me as well. And I just I couldn't stay away from it. And after that, I went back to school and managed a tuxedo shop during the day and at night managed a movie theater and then uh, worked in soda sales for a few years. Uh, and then I landed my job at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center as a tech director initially. What did you go back to school for? Which time? Uh, uh, well, you were managing. So I went, to, <laughs> I went back to school a number of times. Back to school for, I don't, I still, I don't have a degree because I never did finish anything school wise. Um, the only thing that I've really like connected with and followed through with is the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Really. So I went for law enforcement. I went for psychology at one point. I went for English literature at one point. I don't know. It's uh, I kind of went all over the place. Yeah, before a couple I of really found my focus. Yeah. So like decision making is probably not your strong suit. Yeah, I could go with that. But real question though, has that ever come up as like something that you feel like is holding you back? Not at all. No. There. Initially within my career, there was a, a fair amount of insecurity around. I stepped into this executive director position. I don't have a degree. And, you know, once I was going to conferences, initially like sizing myself up against other people, that was always in the back of my mind is I don't have the formal education that so many of these people do. Hmm. Only in a psychological standpoint and a self-confidence standpoint, yes. I mean, because the truth is, if you know your community, 
right? And you know what your mission of your organization is. It's never held me back from an operational standpoint here or from doing yeah. my job well. It's it's only held me back mentally on my own from a self-confidence standpoint. So do you feel like you did like a lot of like on the job training? I, I honestly feel like a lot of the jobs that I held before working here were my training. Uh, managing a retail tuxedo shop, doing customer relations and sales with Pepsi Mid America and selling soda. There's a lot of customer relation built in there. There's also some negotiation built in there. Things like managing the movie theater, managing a full concession stand, managing yeah, inventory yeah, there. Yeah. You're managing crowds, access, tickets. It's all of the operational things. Having the technical yeah. theater background and knowing how to run a show, all of those things ended up coming, kind of coming together and having the right levels of experience in all kinds of different facets that all came together into one thing. Was was there anything that you that took you longer to, to grasp, like moving into the theater realm full time or like that executive director position? Like that you didn't get from those from those other jobs. Looking back, my understanding of of the industry was completely turned around and false. Like I, mm. I, I viewed it all adversarially. I viewed everything as, you know, like a negotiation. It's me against you. It's not us together. And I now know that that's false. Um, and I and I viewed that with with initially with people renting the facility, I, I, everything was going to be adversarial. I went into everything with that mindset of, all right, I'm, I'm going to have a meeting. Let's get ready for battle. That mindset had to change. And that was just a, a matter of honestly maturity and, and learning the industry more and learning what it's really all about. That we're, as a performing arts industry, we're really all in this together. I think that that's an interesting thing just because I was the same way when I first started out. And I, and I know a lot of new executive directors that have the exact same approach who have this idea of the rates are the rates of the rates like this is what this is and you know may not understand that sometimes you should go lower um, for various reasons but yeah it is it is interesting that that seems to be the knee-jerk reaction at the, at the beginning is to have that sort of adversarial mindset and then eventually like growth happens and you go oh this actually doesn't benefit anybody if if we do this like it actually just hurts our organization well and I, I think it's also a view of the business world in general that as as someone coming into it that hasn't been within it, you view everything as adversarial. Within business communities, it doesn't have to be, even outside of our industry. The, the more you can collaborate across platforms and across businesses, the better it is for everybody. Um, there's growth to be had, and, and that's not just the performing arts. And that's how a true business community within a region is built. Yeah, I wonder if that's like a fear-based thing. I just wonder, you know, if it's people that are like afraid to be being taken advantage of or like being afraid to, you know, be wrong or viewed as less than if you if you have that like at the, at the beginning of your career. I think you know what that's saying? part of it. Looking at the way television in general portrays business relationships, it shapes everything to be adversarial. Shark Tank does that. Mm. The sharks pit each other, pit against each other within it. The Apprentice was incredibly adversarial and created a horrible business model for people th to think. Well, to succeed, I have to be vicious and cutthroat. Yeah. I think that that's a fascinating thing that is that is changing, I think, with our generation. I know like my parents generation was very much a more or less a, a dictatorship kind of leadership style. And ours seems to be like this more collaborative thing uh, where I mean, I know that the more I collaborate with my team, because I mean, there's a reason that, that we've hired them to, to do those jobs. Um, we get more done. Like we, we just naturally do better when we have that collaboration versus me going like, this is how it is. And I used to be that, like, I used to think that that's, that's the way a boss should be. And also like, you shouldn't have like, like personal relationships uh, in, in the office, like that you shouldn't have like friendships with your employees. Cause that's just the way that you were sort of taught. And like, now it's like, no, like you should give a shit about your team. Like, yeah. You should yeah. care about the people that you're spending yeah. all of your time with. It's, it's being able to, to walk into the room and knowing, Hey, I'm not going to have the best idea here. I just need to be open to what the best idea is and what, whenever it presents itself, be able to identify what the best idea is. Yeah. Being and able not to analyze. Yeah. Being able to analyze what other people are, are putting in front of you and, and saying, that's wonderful. Let's move forward with that. Yeah. Over my 16 years, my, my leadership style, my management style has changed immensely. At this point, I, I very, very rarely say, hey, we have a problem. Here's how we're going to fix it. Yeah. It is, hey, we have this issue we have this that we need to do help me think about this yeah. we'll come back in three days in three days we'll c come together to have an answer for this i i, I won't name any names in this story but i uh, a team member that, that that i work with um you know very different like leadership style um at, at, at a different organization and so 
here they would always like come at me hot with something and like just like real hot and be like you know we need to do this and this and i finally had to tell him like look the hardest part about this is that you're right and i know that i was like but when you come at me hot like this like it's so hard for me to back down and say like no but like i always do and be like all right you're right but i was like just come at me a little more gently like that's let's let's collaborate on this versus just you know being so aggressive with this but like she'd gotten so used to that because of like previous like leadership styles like she felt she had to do that i was like no no I was like, all you're going to do is upset me and then make me dig, dig in, which is something I, I try to get better at. But <laughs> I do feel, I don't know if it's like a female thing or a me thing or like a younger person in the room thing, but I have always felt a pressure of, well, if you're not coming up with the best idea or you're like not contributing, then are you secure here? What reputation is that? And I've always felt like a huge pressure to be able to fix the problem. I do think that there could be like different viewpoints and ways to look at that, but I, I always try to remind myself in a lot of those kind of things is that in very few situations, is there like a scarcity of resources? If somebody else gets a slight advantage, I don't lose everything, right? If I help somebody else achieve something, that doesn't mean that I've fully lost or like I didn't also achieve something. And I think for so long, the narrative has been winners and losers, where it's so few situations, especially in these negotiations in the industry where there's winners and losers. Like we're trying to get to two winners. Us as organizations, we can't win all the time because then we have no artists to present. The, the vice versa also is, is the same. I mean, if, yeah. if they only win, like and eventually like an organization has to close or can't present as much, like that's right. also a loss. Right. So. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like getting to a place where we both feel like, oh, we're going to be successful with this. That's the win. And I like and it's hard too if you feel like you're going if you're negotiating with somebody that's in that different mindset, too, of, you know, you don't want to get like fully taken advantage of. So there's always a balance. But yeah, I truly appreciate yeah. knowing that like the industry is a little bit more collaborative than I definitely thought it was in the first two. <laughs> For sure. So, so Josh, you were saying, so you've been at the Marion Cultural Civic Center for 16 years Mm -hmm. and obviously your, your mindset has changed both from a leadership standpoint and a, you know, industry and negotiation standpoint. Is there, or was there like a moment where, where that like either clicked or like started to shift that, that you can recall looking back? It it was a slow development. I mean, it wasn't until my mind shift had changed that I noticed it. It was, there was never like a, an immediate like clicking moment that, oh, I've been doing this wrong. I'm going to do it differently now. It, it was a slowly learning and identifying things and, and building into what is a better model as you recognize different things in the industry. And I, and I won't, I won't lie. There are still negotiations that are say on a commercial standpoint, uh, whenever you're dealing with really big name artists, those artists are going to win every time. And it's just a matter of finding a way for you to win as well. Like that, that is not a collaborative negotiation. The, the big name artists, they have what they're going to get no matter what, Mm -hmm. you know, there is very little room for negotiation there, but whenever it comes to really arts and performing arts presenting. It it really has to be that collaborative model. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Marion Cultural and Civic Center? Whenever I started at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center, we were having approximately 39 public events a year and a total of 115 rental dates in total. That included the five shows that we presented and then the local theater organizations that had rehearsal time in here as well. Those rental dates included that rehearsal time. So 39 per public performances and a total of about 115, 120 full rental dates per year. At this point, we are 370 some odd rentals per year um, because we will have multiple rental dates. We'll have something, we'll have an event in the lobby and we'll have uh, a rehearsal on the stage at the same time. Uh, and we have, a, I think it was 163 public performance dates last year. That's huge. Over the 16 years, the Marion Cultural and Civic Center has changed and developed immensely. Our presenting budget, whenever I started, was $40,000. Our presenting budget now is $1.2 million. That has obviously been a giant change uh, in both the acts that are accessible to us within those fee ranges to the amount of things that we can present to this community. The other thing that we've built up is at that point, we had one promoter uh, who was bringing things in. And now we have five promoters that, that bring things into the space. In addition, five more promoters that bring things into the space. The the one promoter has been working with the Marion Cultural and Civic Center since the 1980s, has 
It was either late 80s or early 90s and has done literally hundreds of concerts here and all in the contemporary Christian music realm. And that's one of the things whenever I started, the majority of the, the public shows were contemporary Christian or Southern gospel. It took probably 10 years to, uh, to kind of break the public stigma of we're a Christian event center mm. that focused purely on Christian events. And it was just because the promoters that were renting the space were presenting that and it created an identity around the venue that wasn't we're bringing cultural development and arts to the community. It was just facilitating religious experiences here. And so it took a long time to change that outlook, change that stigma about the space. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with development of additional theater companies. So one thing that we do here is we focus on the local community, the local arts first before we focus on the presenting. Whenever we build out our calendar each year, the dates for the local theater companies, which is three local theater companies. In total, they do seven shows in here per year. And we block out their full tech week and performance weekend for each one of those. Those things go on the calendar before any of our promoters have access to booking dates or before we start booking dates ourselves. And so we we focus on facilitating that cultural growth within the community and building those relationships and building appreciation for the arts and for theater in the community above the presenting and the commercial aspect of it. Was there a changing point to that or like a, a changing mindset, like as a municipal presenter, like was, do you have like no. a board or like a, we um, have a board and there was an ordinance that established the Marion Cultural and Civic Center in 1974. And that ordinance focused on having a low rental rate to facilitate the growth of a cultural atmosphere within the community. That language was built into the law that established the venue. And so that has been the focus from the very beginning is to build that cultural atmosphere within the community. And so our rental rates are still ridiculously low for community events. They're still pretty low for promoters as well, but but community events are paying $600 a day for a performance day. Uh, they're paying $25 an hour for rehearsal time. Wow. Both of those things are below our cost to run the building for those times, but it is put in place so that those organizations have a place to grow and flourish. Have you seen that happen um, in Marion since then? And have you seen like new yes. organizations pop up as well or just? Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, there was just one theater company and it mm. was the resident theater company. They did plays and that's it. That theater company no longer exists exists because two children's theater companies came up and then an adult theater company came up. All of them produce musical theater. In addition to that, we also have the high school and the junior high musical every year in our space. So there are, there are actually nine weeks of theater built into our calendar every year before we do anything. In addition to that, we also have a number of dance dance companies that have their dance recitals here. To me, it's one of the most amazing things because there are families who have had three generations all dance on the stage here. Mm, love that. Moving into f the fourth generation. And so we're creating multi-generational like core shared memories that are attached to the space and that are attached to an art form within the community. Uh, and that's something truly magical that that creates a connection to the venue for those families and for those people that that will never leave them. So are you balancing the funding to be able to provide those things at such a low cost with the ticketing fees um, and and concession sales and things like that? Yes. Or what, so where's the other side of the, the budget sheet coming from? So the city actually underwrites a tremendous amount of it mm -hmm. as well. The city underwrites a, a portion of our budget that allows for those rental rates to be what they are. As far as presenting, the presenting end of it needs to be balanced within the concession, within the you know ticket fees and concession sales and bar sales. All of that needs to help to balance out um, with ticket sales to completely balance out on the presenting side. But whenever it comes to those low budget rentals... And just that ongoing maintenance and... Ongoing maintenance, building Keeping the building, yeah. Yeah, and all of that is underwritten by the city of Marion. Wow. And we are we are a municipal facility. Yeah. I I work for the city of Marion, and I I answer directly to the mayor and his chief of staff. Yeah, so our organization is similar to that, and I just I love that structure within a town and within a city because it does allow for so much arts experience on the individual uh, 
community member. They can come and see the performances. You've got all those children's performances, the dance. I mean, you can see how it's touching all of the different community members outside of just the presenting aspect. And I, I just think it's a perfect like way to kind of, I mean, I think both of us know that there's like some problems um, and, you know, just some things that are a little bit silly that come up in those kind of scenarios. But There are, but... The- but I, I think the, the cons outweigh the pros. Or no, the pros outweigh the cons. <laughs> I hope so. I hope yeah. the pros outweigh the cons. God, I'm bad at, uh, the, what are those called? Examples? <laughs> uh, a few years ago, uh, a new mayor took office and his administration viewed what we did here in a very different way. And that's that's honestly the biggest propulsion of the change of our budget. Up until five years ago, our budget had gone from 40000 to 75000 And so all of the rest of that budget change for presenting has happened since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever the new mayor took office, he said, look, the facility is not being utilized utilized in the way that it can. What do you need to make that happen? And let's make it happen. Because Kevin, say utilized. View, utilized. <laughs> his <laughs> outlook was, so we're, we are located on the historic downtown square. And like downtowns across America, our historic downtown had kind of been dying as a business hub for a long time. And his view was that creating more foot traffic and creating more commerce through the arts would facilitate redevelopment of our downtown. In addition to the city putting in additional funding to actually renovate sidewalks and renovate the public spaces and and literally refresh the downtown. And over the last five years, it has worked beautifully because at this point, there is not a space for rent or for lease within four blocks of the downtown square. All of the spaces are filling up and not being or are currently under renovation. All of that has worked. And watching that model of commerce through the arts and the arts facilitating the business and the commerce for a small town and for a community has been absolutely tremendous. Wow. Yeah, I have nothing to say because that's my favorite thing. (laughs) That's That's the story we all want to be able to tell. The mayor touts what we've been doing here. He touts the the names that have been coming here, the shows that have been coming here, fully understands that there will be shows that will not make money and he's not worried about those um, as long as we're bringing in some big commercial shows that will make money that balance those out. And so the the big names and the big commercial events that are solely focused for ticket sales and perpetuating a, a big name underwrite the cultural opportunities that we bring in on tours as well. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like this story is the dream. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's also the story that we consistently tell and try to explain to people that the arts are more than just, you know, just, a, just entertainment. I mean, it really does drive the economy and clearly like what's happening in Marion is a prime example of that, um, that you have an opportunity to have real economic development through, through performance. Yeah. And, and through the perpetuation of the yeah. arts and, mm-hmm. And using the arts as a focus point to bring people down because a business, you know, small shops and restaurants and can't survive without foot traffic. Yeah. Creating that foot traffic is one of our primary goals. Yeah. I mean, that that investment is is paying off like considerably more than what the city's putting into it. Um, And it's just it's helping a community and business owners and people thrive, which, again, like is the thing we all know that happens when you fund the arts well. I don't know how many times we have to show these studies, talk about these things until people will go, oh, hey, maybe if we did more of this. (laughs) I feel like I'm an incredibly lucky position that I have that kind of support and that kind of commitment from our from our city to underwrite and to to really focus on what we are doing uh, and that they view us as an asset. So when we talk about some more assets, you've been involved also in beautifying the downtown um, and and doing the mural creation. Why don't you give us a little backstory on that? So COVID-19 came around and we shut down like everyone else. We immediately started doing virtual programming. Womp womp. There's a limited life span on virtual programming. It was, we, it was incredibly successful. We... We started within a week of shuttering our doors. We started our, our virtual programming because we, of the many side hustles I've had, I had a ton of video equipment. And so we already had all of the actual physical things that we needed to create virtual content. And so we could immediately start doing that. And our focus at that point was to look at local musicians, local artists, have them perform 
and us put it out there. They could only perform original uh, original songs. And so we did that for 39 shows. And our goal was to to keep those local musicians, keep paying local musicians during the times that they couldn't play out at bars and restaurants and the places where they would be playing. And so it was to support our local art scene. In addition, it gave us a way to continue a connection and a relationship with our patrons through social media because all of our virtual programming was all free. And then, you know, we we eventually shut that down because restaurants and bars started to open back up. What our goal was, was done. People could go and see live entertainment again on a local level. Once we facilitated that gap period, later in that year, later in 2020, we had always wanted a mural outside of the Marion Cultural and Civic Center in an alleyway that approaches it. Um, just to beautify that alley to make it a more accessible walking space to get from parking lots and parking into our space. With that, I started working with an artist and he was going to design the mural and then initially wasn't going to come up. And being the person who I am who blindly jumps into things, whether I'm qualified for them or not, I said, well, I, I mean, if you're not going to come up, then I'll just, I'll, I'll paint it if you give me the design. What could go wrong? Right? <laughs> Luckily, through the design and back and forth conversations, he's like, I really do want to come up and work on this. And I said, oh, thank God. I'll still help you. I, I hopped into that and I said, look, I'll paint large blocks of color. That's probably where my skill set ends. Within a few days, I was hand painting, lettering and doing fine detail work. And I never looked back. And I kept saying, you know, I've never done anything like this before. This is all new to me. And then a friend of mine sent me a, a picture from one of our, from a set design that I had put together that had a large 16 by 20 mural piece on the back wall that I had painted for this set. But in my you know, I was just painting scenery at that point. Mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't painting something that was going to be permanent on the wall. So it never connected to me that they were the same thing. But scenic painting and mural painting are almost the exact same thing. They're both just a really large format art form. From that one mural, I never looked back. I have now painted on 13 murals in our downtown. The city also invested $100,000 into the mural project and hired uh, nine artists to come into town and paint murals as well. With that progression, multiple businesses within the, within the city saw all of this happening and said, I'm willing to invest myself and had murals painted on their buildings. And so we're now, we're at 28 or 29 murals in our downtown whenever I think we had two before we painted the one in the, that alley. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And so over impressive. the last three years, we, we've really, it's literally changed the face of our downtown. It's, it's energized it. There is art, there is public art everywhere that you walk in our downtown now. And that changes the feel of a space tremendously. Yeah, it does. And it increases civic pride. And and once again, the city, This I was salary and the civic center was closed. And the city was like, we're, we're going to keep paying you. Just keep painting. Done and done. And so yeah. I, I was essentially a salaried mural artist for the city of Marion for a couple of years. And once again, it's that commitment to the arts in developing in redeveloping a downtown and making the arts central to that redevelopment of the downtown that has been key to all of this. In the musical of your life, there would be a version of um, defying gravity that would happen <laughs> in this part, especially when she sings changed for good. I actually, I love that you brought up that, that song <laughs> title just because what happened during that mural period was incredibly pivotal to who I am now as a person. At the beginning on that very first mural, while we're painting it, I had always been a little sarcastic and, uh, you know, positivity wasn't a primary focus of mine. I was somewhat of a negative, had somewhat of a negative outlook in general. And while I was working on this, we had 700 people come up and watch us paint. That's a loose count because honestly, we couldn't keep track because we were trying to paint a mural, but people just kept coming up and watching us paint and watching us just put paint on a wall. And at that point, I had this mental shift where I said, you know, I am, I'm at this point where all these eyes are on what we're doing. Why would I put anything but positive out into this world when I can positively affect anything? Why put anything? And it, it also had to do with how divisive the times were on the debate of COVID as a whole and what people were doing and what communities were doing, what governments were doing. And with all of that negativity swirling around, why put anything into this world that wasn't something positive? And that changed everything about how I approached the world at that point. And I, I, I remember decisively during that mural process, 
that switch happening. And I've never looked back. And I, I honestly am so happy that that moment happened because simply going through the world now with a positive outlook on everything has changed the way that I see the world. And I couldn't be more grateful for that experience just for, for creating that paradigm shift for me as a change for good. So Josh, with, with, that, with that change in outlook, um, has that had an effect on the way that you parent? Yeah, I, my daughter, Mary Claire, is going to turn eight. Just being a positive force in her life makes me so incredibly proud. But she also gets to see she also gets to see how I live that out. She comes to the office with me some of the time. She's in around the theater whenever productions are here, when shows are here. With those community theater groups, it got to the point to where when she was like three and four years old, she would play on those sets constantly to the point that the guys building the sets, whenever she walked into the theater, they would say, Mary Claire, come and look at what we built for you. <laughs> and so she had this mindset that it was all for her, uh, which from an egocentric standpoint, honestly, I hope is a healthy start because anything to build somebody's confidence starting out, they need, we all need. Mm -hmm. And so anything like that, the, the positive, living a positive outlook is the best possible example I could set for my daughter. But then, you know, just having her around the theater all the time and having her around the arts and not that it's easy to balance time within an executive director role and being here for shows, but also maintaining office hours and then also working on murals. And then, you know, on top of that, my wife and I, we own a uh, children's clothing boutique as well called Whimsy. And so our daughter sees both of us working very hard because it, that's not my wife's primary job. She's a elementary school principal. She's actually my daughter's principal. So my daughter gets to see my amazing wife in a powerful role as the principal of the elementary school. And then she also gets to see her through the entrepreneurial lens of owning a children's boutique. And she sees us making time for uh, both of our full-time jobs and then both of us making time for the boutique and then also making time for her and making time for mural work and artwork, working towards my artistic outlets and what I'm passionate about. Well, and she'll never know the city of Marion without public art and no. people walking around um, and, and, and a, just a bustling picturesque sounding. Place. Well, and it, additionally, the, every one of the murals that I've worked on, I've hidden her initials in. And so her initials are actually incorporated into artwork all throughout the community. All right. So, you know, our dear friend, Brian has a time machine and he agreed to let me borrow it just so that you could go back in time and give advice to your past self. So while you were making the switch um, and joining uh, the Marion Civic and Cultural Center as the executive director, um, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, two, two pieces of advice would be... I said one. Dang it. Um, All of the rules for once. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So to start, it would be just be a good person. Be nice to people in every aspect. Figure out the best way to work Did you miss that day of together. elementary school? Continue. Be nice yeah, to people. So just be nice. Be a good person person and lead with love with all of it. Additionally, take that into every aspect of the business that you're trying to work toward and create in working on deals, in working with clients, in working with patrons, every aspect of it. If you lead with the positive, lead with the love and, and invite people to have a positive experience, it's going to happen that way. Cool, cool, cool. So what's your favorite thing about the industry today? My favorite thing right now is this point that we're at in the industry where there are a lot of new faces coming in. And at the same time, we're all coming out of the pandemic and we're coming out of what was such a turbulent time, but yet a shared experience. So we're all coming from the same place for once. And I think that gives us this wonderful opportunity to create and, and shape the industry in the way that it really should be, which is this positive, collaborative, you know, working towards the benefit of everyone. And if we if we all take that opportunity and move forward, that's my absolute favorite thing about this exact time in the industry is the opportunity that we have. What do you hope is coming in the next five to 10 years? What do you hope the changes are? I, I hope that there's more equity, especially within like transparent contracting. Every contract should list 
what the full potential of ticket sales is and how that benefit goes towards both parties. That's one just very easy, clear transparency and equity practice that can move forward and be spread across the industry is just having that present in the contract so that everybody knows what the potential for each for each party is rather than, hey, we've got a contract you're going to get paid this much, we're moving forward. And then it turns out the potential for the, let's say the potential for the hall would be so much higher and greater and not advantageous to the artist and the the presenters actually taking advantage of the situation. And so by having that transparency, it creates an opportunity for equity within contracting. And I think that's going to be really important. Josh, it has been a pleasure to get to know you a bit more as you know, the the head of the Marion Cultural Civic Center as an artist, as a father, as a, honestly, a committed member of your community and, you know, and fellow podcast host. So this has been great. I feel like we could easily talk for another hour or two hours. Um, but, you know, I just want to thank you for taking the time to chat with Danielle and I today. Thanks, guys. This has been a blast. So thank you, Kevin and Danielle, for letting Katie and I finally in the room. <laughs> we were just out in the hall, like waiting to be let in. Yeah. Yeah. The claw marks on the door are crazy. <laughs> From what I could hear through the glass on the, on the other side of the wall, it sounded like a fun conversation. So I only have slight FOMO. I've known Josh for many years now, and I've learned a lot just from this conversation. Brian, I agree. Getting to know Josh uh, in a different way was so enjoyable for me. I knew that you had like a bunch of jobs, Josh, but not the wide array and plethora of jobs that you had before you finally made your way to this uh, cultural and civic center. And I, you know, frankly appreciated getting to hear your full journey and how all of those things really did lead you to that moment where you became the technical director and then the executive director. Like you're so right. Every single one of those positions you had prior gave you those skill sets that have made you successful um, in the position that you're in now. So I think there's just a ton to take in and learn and think about um, over the course of your journey. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. And I left off a handful of things too. There's some bar backing <laughs> and bartending and other things in there as well. But... Yeah. I'm going to need a CV on this. <laughs> 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 yeah. We need a timeline, a time, yeah. Josh Benson timeline of jobs. <laughs> It doesn't matter what job you're doing now. It's there's always something you can learn from it and and take with you to to wherever you go. Yeah, and that's a that's something that's really important for me. Having not having a degree, but really having all of these different avenues of experience that that led to my levels of expertise for for doing what I'm doing now is setting my career apart for me. And that really is why we need to value applicants for any position with the, the full self that they bring to the table and not just check boxes that take people out of the running because they haven't paid an institution. That's a good point. Anyway. An absorbent amount of money mm -hmm. for a piece of yes. paper. Um, there's obviously a lot more that goes into education than that, but just emphasizing really the full person and the full experience, um, you know, yields really great results, it turns out. Mm -hmm. So whenever I got hired for the position of tech director at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center, one of the things that the uh, interviewing panel was most excited about was my experience working on actual film projectors and repairing film projectors and being able to operate them as a projectionist. Because at that point, they were still showing actual movies via film. That was one of like the final like buttons that that captured the job for me. Speaking of tech, I, I also like the moment in the conversation when Josh brings up uh, how they, they quickly transition into doing virtual programming. And Danielle's response was wah, wah, which <laughs> is so common. I have to say, you know, as, as a leader of an arts consortium and, you know, working in, in that setting during the pandemic, um, that was a lot of people's response because they all had failed attempts and whatnot. But I knew Josh's story already of success. Like there are stories of success from doing live streaming and doing all of that virtual stuff that all of us tried essentially, but only few of us uh, were able to, to find a, a magic in doing that. And Josh was one of them. So he was a big inspiration. And he, in fact, I invited him to talk about those experiences when we were doing a, a PD session with PA presenters during the pandemic, because he, he was just doing an amazing job. So, so I do take my womp womp back, but... <laughs> I will say I was feeling particularly sassy that day. And we didn't notice at all. <laughs> Which I loved. <laughs> 
And that's unfortunate that now it's preserved for all the time. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I'm glad you said it because again, a lot of that's a lot of people's feelings. Even now, a lot of people think yeah. that it's all just bad, but actually I still live stream and successfully it's different. It's not what people thought, oh, to make money or a new way, you know, but, but through our uh, music department, it, it's valuable to them because a lot of, we have a lot of international students. We have a lot of families that live so far away from the university and we have students that are performing on a regular basis that their families never get to see them. So it, when we don't live stream one of their concerts, we hear about it like, Hey, where's the live stream? We want to see our kid, you know? And so just that alone is making connections. It's not only like bring, bringing out the arts, uh, performances for the community and other people, but for the families directly. And, th and they really value it. Kevin and Josh, I really appreciated learning more about how the city government is supporting investment, in arts and culture and the huge impact that that shift has made in Marion. And just learning all those details is really fascinating. I knew a little bit of that story just from knowing you, Josh, but I do think it's one of these examples that should be lifted up in terms of how institutions really can make a difference if you invest in the right way and what those ripple effects can be. And so I'd love to see that story told further, you know, in our industry and held up as like, yeah, look at what can actually happen. As Kevin emphasizes and regular here on the podcast, the arts are so pivotal to local economies and quality of life and civic pride and those sorts of things. So I really appreciate like diving into the level of detail that you offered us. And I hope other people really take that as a, a strong example of what they could be doing in their communities too. And that's things that have happened in the last five years. That's the part of it too, that I think is really incredible is that sometimes it seems like, oh, making an investment in this, like that's going to pay back in who knows how long from now. Um, but like in a five years time, I mean, you've seen actual prosperity happening downtown. I mean, it, it didn't take really that long. It didn't. And some of the magic behind that is really the leaders in the community, both within the government itself and the business leaders in the community, all getting behind it 100% and putting everything they had behind it. Um, there was a ton of private investment involved here as well. But that private investment was inspired by what the city was doing for that development. It was nice that you opened up about your change of heart and how you've softened and be, you know, looking at the the positivity and everything now. And when I was done puking in my mouth, I was like, yeah, that's that's a really <laughs> true statement, but also important. But anyway, I, I also appreciated the three of you discussing transparency and negotiations and contracting. And obviously we've made some strides in that area, but there's still a long way to go. And I think you hit a, a lot of the important points on that and why it's not happening. But it, it comes down to which we come keep coming back to is relationships. And the stronger and deeper the relationships have been on both sides, it seems like the more transparent things have, have been getting, which is wonderful to see. But you can understand why people that are new into the business or new to just knowing each other, you're still a little bit leery. It's like, you know, I don't want to be open and give every, put all the cards on the table and and then think that they are, but they're really, you know, being... Uh, manipulative. And then that's because, unfortunately, there are a few people like that in the industry on both sides of the fence that ha that do take advantage and, and they give a bad name for one or the other if someone has that experience. But the hope is that it's spreading, the positive part of it is spreading more and more. So Josh, I wanted to ask now that you had a chance to like reflect and discuss your career and your trajectory. And then, you know, we listened back to the interview, obviously to like do edits and, and prep for this conversation. Um, is there anything that you didn't realize before or has that you've been thinking about since having this conversation with Kevin and Danielle that maybe like hadn't crossed your mind before you hadn't realized? Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about since is to really be more intentional with my time with my daughter. And to be more intentional with family time as well, just because for the longest time, I was really bad at that. So attempting to be better at that and to be even whenever I am working, to be more present and FaceTime my daughter before she goes to bed and, and to text my wife and let her know how the show's going and, and not just be locked into work mode so hard. Because that's a place where I've, I've failed tremendously as both a father and a husband in that way in the past. And, and that's where I feel like I really need to improve. I would say try to be a little more kind to yourself because I know you have improved that tremendously. And the fact that you're even thinking about it shows that you're there. It's on the top of your mind. And, and I'm sure 
they would say you're a great dad. So. Oh, thanks, Brian. Well, thanks, friends, for having this conversation with us. And Josh, thanks for sitting down with Danielle and I. And to everyone listening, we look forward to you tuning in next week. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Vanho. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? (laughs) I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus i every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Josh, were you nervous being interviewed? No, no, I don't really do the whole nervous thing. That's a lie. It's, <laughs> he was, he came in like super sweaty, like was just very nervous. And mostly I think it was because of Danielle. Like, so. I mean, that's fair. I do have an ice cold interview face. She came with like a list of gotcha questions. I mean, I mean, the very first question was a gotcha question. <laughs> That is true. Yeah, it that truly is true. Was, she had yeah. her own answers for a lot of questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you guys let me do this. So. <laughs> it would be boring without you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> truth. The only other thing I want to ask is, um, I lent Danielle my time machine, and I haven't seen it since. If someone finds it, can they please get it to me? I, you know, we have more interviews. That coming thing up. got oh, trashed. Oh, we sold it. 